Okay. All right. Good evening or day as the case may be, wherever you are. I'm Akua Leslie Hope speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Onondaga, also known as the Seneca, keepers of the Western Door in the area currently called the Southern Finger Lakes region of New York State. American democracy was founded on the principles of government practiced by these people. I pay homage to the Seneca, past, present, and future, as I do to my own ancestors by whose grace I exist and am sustained. This is the second of four dispatches from my journey on my path to create Afrofuturist speculative pastoral poetry. My thanks to the New York State Council for the Arts and poets and writers whose support makes this endeavor and presentation possible. I am joined this hour by Eugene Bacon, who I will introduce more extensively and formally a bit later. These quarterly gatherings are on the theme of Afrofuturist speculative pastoral poetry. Allow me to define terms. Speculative poetry, the poetry of possibilities, includes a range of imaginative fantastic, supernatural, and mythological themes. It presents the unreal as real. It takes all forms, including one of its own called Sai Bai Ku, the world's first recorded literature. The world's first recorded literature was in the form of verse and it was speculative. Speculative poetry is ancient of days and older than the flood. Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic exploring themes and concerns of the African diaspora through technoculture and the speculative, encompassing a range of media and artists with a shared interest in envisioning Black futures. Afrofuturism is an intersection of speculation and liberation, inspired by the concerns of people of African descent. The act of speculating about liberation has a long, long history. And Afrofuturism seeks in part to recover knowledge lost as a result of enslavement and colonialism. Pastoral, simplest to define, it means the country. Here's a sci-fi coup. City kid, fears, yards, garter, snake, groundhog, not UFO landing. City kid fears yards, garter, snake, groundhog, not UFO landing. On my journey, I discovered an ancestor to the Afrofuturist speculative pastoral. I did not know this person existed and I don't want anyone else to stumble along not knowing of his history and precedent setting genius. Jean Joseph, Rabia Ravello, the greatest 20th century poet of Madagascar and called the first modern 
poet of Africa, was born in 1901 in an impoverished but noble family in the capital city, Antananarivo. He joined other Malagasy poets and writers to start a literary movement termed Hitati Niveri, the search for lost values, to promote the traditional literary and oral arts of Madagascar. He committed suicide in 1937. After Madagascar's independence in 1960, he was declared the national poet of Madagascar. A street and a high school are named after him and Antananarivo. Jean Joseph Rabia Rivello said he originally wrote the poems that I will read to you in Traduit de la Nuit in Malagasy and then translated them into French. Traduit de la Nuit is translated from the night. Here's some words about him. With remarkable originality, he synthesized Europe's prevailing urban surrealism with his own comparatively bucolic surroundings. In Rabia Rivello, we are offered the best aspect of two poetic traditions the wildly innovative imagery of modern surrealism permeated with the essence of traditional oral poetry, clear communication. John Joseph Rabia Rivello regards metamorphosis as a fact of life with many of his poems deriving their beauty from transformations. Metamorphosis serves as a poignant motif throughout his poetry. According to Pythagoras, the renowned geometry teacher, the soul acquiring different bodies through continual rebirth undergoes metamorphosis. John Joseph Rabia Rivello was a reader of Ovid. Ovid's Metamorphosis, the ancient anthology of transformational lore is cited as a pervasive influence on his work. But I wonder, is this so or was it just a coat hanger or prevalent indigenous Malagasy beliefs and lore. I'm going to read a couple of poems from translated from the night. Number two. What invisible rat comes from the walls of night, nibbles the milky cake of the moon? Tomorrow morning, when it will have slipped away, there will be traces of blood stained teeth. Tomorrow morning, those who have been drunk all night and those who will be leaving the games upon seeing the moon will stammer thus. Who, 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 whose coin is this? rolling across the green table. Ah, one of them will say, our friends lost everything and killed himself. And all will snigger and staggering will fall. The moon, she will no longer be there. The rat will have carried her away into his hole. Number three, the hide of the black cow has been stretched, stretched without being set to dry, stretched 
within its sevenfold shadow. But who has felled the black cow, dead without having lowed, dead without having roared, dead without having been pursued over this prairie flowered with stars? Here is the one who lodges in half of the sky. Stretched is the hide over a box resonant with winds sculpted by the spirits of sleep. And the drum is ready when gladioli crown the horns of the delivered calf who bounds and grazes with the hills of grass. There it will resound and its incantations will become dreams until the moment when the black cow is resurrected white and pink before a river of light. And I'll read last number 30, which is the last poem in the collection. And I remind listeners, this was written circa 1934. Oh, my heart. Number 30. Vain all these anticipations that claim to give us wings and promise that one day will seduce some Martian? Vain to the dream that lost Icarus more than the sun that drank the marvelous wax? Yet what certain triumph announced to me by all these signs that earth and sky send out from the borders of sleep. Within our cities of the living, even the most humble of huts respond to the calls of fire bursting from newborn stars. Uh, John Joseph Rabia Rivello. I'm grateful you existed. If I say Black Brigadoon, am I being reductive, referring to a mythology that does not serve? Brigadoon, a place which disappears and reappears to live its life for one glorious day of feasting while it awaits and avoids the terrible, terrible world. A myth, a place that has stayed in my mind since I was a child. I just learned about Timbuktu. In the 1840s, the North Elba region in the Adirondacks was the location of a grand effort to establish voting rights for free Blacks, who by law had to own property in order to participate in elections. The story of Timbuktu begins with a massive collection of land grants to Black families, a handful of whom carved out small farming communities in the Adirondacks and earned the power to vote. Their legacy is a cornerstone of Adirondack history and a milestone in the effort of Black Americans to become full citizens in their own country. To learn about Timbuktu in the Adirondacks, a black village, a black experiment in New York State in the piney magic woods among great trees and untrammeled nature is an amazement. 
to learn that John Brown was somehow involved with this, that others of the era knew of this place and now it's been erased. So while I sought the Afro-futuristic speculative pastoral, it lived, it lived in word and deed, a utopia made manifest, yet now disappeared. And I wonder about those that I know about from that era. Did they know if this place existed? Did John W. Jones, who rescued 800 people in the 19th century in Elmira next door, and how many people does the 800 he rescued now represent? 800 souls from that horror of a multi-generational Holocaust that was slavery. Did he know about this other dream in this same state, in this same upstate? And the name that they named it Timbuktu was wild and synchronous. Oh, for those of you who see me misting up, because you know that Timbuktu exists in Mali and Africa as the repository of great learning, but it came into my life again out of history books when dear beloved Afro-surrealist poet artist Ted Jones sought to create an African diasporic museum to place the representations of us in the West back in the homeland in Timbuktu, in Mali. And I know this because as a college student, he sent me on missions to secret magic places not unlike those depicted in movies, in parts of New York City that my native to New York parents had not ever heard of, where there were still raised streets, raised sidewalks and cobblestone streets to tiny shops that expanded when you entered them to retrieve African-American tchotchkes, knickknacks, labels, postcards of perversion and distortion that were nonetheless valuable historic records. Decades before I knew of black paraphernalia collectors, because this was the mid 1970s, Ted Jones in Paris sent me on these journeys in New York City I'd not yet met him, but I read him and fell in love with his naked body on the back of his book of poetry and wrote him. And he wrote back with instructions to gather this stuff to send to Timbuktu, where the repository of these experiences would reside. And I wonder because here century apart, the name Timbuktu from Mali lived in New York State and was refreshed again as the poet artist creator sought to create something there. That the spirit of resistance never, ever, ever faded. It never died. The embers always glowed when the very pain of my ancestors is within me. Even the pain of my parents whose own efforts, whose own genius was denied. And my own, I must express joy to be able to glimpse the possibilities, to have these moments of peace. They are momentary, but perhaps my nivellings will know more security than I do. I'd now like to introduce my guest for this 
evening and thank you, thank you for joining us from the future. Eugen Bacon, PhD, is an African Australian author of several novels and fiction collections who lives in Melbourne, Australia in the future. Her recent books, or maybe I'm in the past, her recent books, Ivory's Story, Danged Black Thing, and Saving Shadows, are finalists in the British Science Fiction Association Awards. Did you hear me? Three books at once are finalists in the British Science Fiction Association Awards. Eugen was announced in the honor list of the 2022 Otherwise Fellowships for doing exciting work in gender and speculative fiction. She has won or been commended in national and international awards, including the Aurelis Award, Forward Indies Awards, Bridport Prize, Copyright Agency Prize, Horror Writers Association Diversity Grant, otherwise Australian Shadows Awards, Ditmar Awards, and Nomo Awards for Speculative Fiction by Africans. She is nominated for 2022 Reisling and Elgin Awards. Her new books are, this woman is profoundly powerful and prolific. Her new books are Mage of Fools, a novel, Chasing Whispers collection, and Earnest Blackness collection. You can find her at eugenbacon.com and Twitter at Eugen Bacon. Welcome, Eugen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Akua. It's beautiful listening to you talking and reading the poetry with such passion. So I'll try to share my screen because I'll read two illustrations. Thank you. So to begin, I am in Melbourne. And I would like to acknowledge the First Nations, the first storytellers and traditional owners of the land we live in, the Wurundjeri and Unwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, to any First Nations people watching and to the elders of the land. Today, I would like to share with you some poetry. She stills a dawn to a place of memory, a beloved place she can enter her stories, the way her fingers pad on the keyboard, the rush that sweeps through her body, arise her at an intersection where mind and fingertip are one. She needs practice, slipping in a little, her lover's breath heartfelt on her earlobe. But she runs when she can to a play-filled memory, enriched with mannequins she can chase, surreal encounters on red rock bicycles. Oh, how she soars. Neither a kitchen nor a sky. Her heart is a room full of photographs and pillars wafting around, rehearsing melancholy and reinstating torment. But there is still no word, just somber silence in the floating photographs and neglected pillows, cup willing like burnt toast, past the Ikea blender and microwave in a fairy tale of space that does not involve breathing. A hanging rope. A hanging rope tastes impossible until you cook it. 
and all ingredients morph into a sea archin, a prickly pear, sea nettles, and hairy chestnuts, all four. Your game is whack, but you say it's chills, with the tone of a scientist bird on the matter of stuffing and a suggestion of minimal existence on high coffee. It's a no brainer. You unveil ancient mushrooms and noxious leaves in a blindfold nest that showers cores into the milk of a coarse car. What you find is that sweet or savory in an open garden, porched or poached, pureed, smoked or scissored, is like chewing on a grass stalk, boiled or blanched as everything spins from galaxies to yarns, metaphorical plates rattling and spinning into prickly needles. Now you're in a bar, then in front of a mirror, inviting you to step into the last bus to a stranger or a grave. Which would you choose? A life partner on Space Station Z, or a beautiful snap in a hanging rope? I wrote this poem in the heart of the pandemic when India was burning, burning. Tons of liquid oxygen buckled too late and a strain. Bones crumble, molecules, energy. It will be weird at first, the next 10 years the carnage of a decade. It's the work of us in a rasping burr, devouring the universe as we'd contest sausages. Disaster capitalism is a thing. Unscientific yoga. Unscientific thinking promotes yoga, acupuncture, myotherapy to purge a pandemic. The health ministry is missing in action. When the rich do nothing, the poor perish. Bitcoin wipes nostalgia clean. Billowing in the clouds, the face of a vulture fully beat. Talons on alert. A formation of birds oblivious in a sea down below. The ICU is a death camp. Tense, more tense. And conscious in a rickshaw. Tickets on the black market, bury gone flesh. A gasp for oxygen. Plumes, a dance of flames. Some days we try to forget. Pretending we're tourists hardened in the last sun. But our hearts are shattered in hot spots and clusters as grief visits. Pyres burn. 300, six, 3,689 body bags in a single day, underreported in a second, third wave. The scale of a crisis. One nation burns. Meanwhile, conspiracies mushroom dumb shit about re engineered sex going viral. Satan's microchips. A mist blanket. She walks with a gap across a city choked in smoke. Each day disrupted as cynics protest and its joke. Theories fly about the governor's fall in her torso why tar-shined ravens and death watch beetles sow through it. No one offers a mist blanket so she can fold her wings at midnight. She looks at herself, mutters a prayer or a dream of rings. Gives anyone who looks 
an abyss of her hollow. And finished. Survival reduced to pickets wakes me at night. Walls painted in stench each day at the beginning of my life. A siren of coppers chases rioters waving placards about paradigm shifts. Faces of my dead friends break out from the wind imprint on each uniform's head, sketching shapes with colorless lips. Hearts weeping, bones humming. I exit by an alleyway, words railing like a president's bisque full of grime. I duck into cold roads of the city, walls pissing unfinished graffiti. I can't breathe. A hobo with an umbrella hands me a parcel of dreams. More sirens, is there a better life? I take its folded dream and its prosthetic limbs, flick it to immortality. Text is your legacy. I call to the drifter, losing himself in the brolly as I flee. Eat it, lest the world murmurs oaths buried in your manuscript. Damaged beyond words. Phone zombies incapable of loving meander across the streets in a smear of shapes, a rain of fate. Disenchanted. With life, they shadow frenetic social media into which that never look like missing. As lightning strikes, winter falls, the silent march is a drum circle. Dogs, yap yap. As the zombies stalk our planet, eyes glued on their smartphones and caring to gravity of friction. As real people pass them by. The ghost of a graph. At the cusp of human and animal, what brings you by is something tragic or a coincidence of strangehood. You're poised with a needle whose tip is moist with a conspiracy etched in numbers and people are dying. It takes time from initial moments to the new scrutiny for officers of the sovereign state to act in the interest of the vulnerable or their actions to reach global fuss. Researchers responding to data as part of a study on the scatter of street lands and ethnic disparity, sequin stories of calamity and gore, but are powerless to trend replicas on body cams clicking across a bridge to quiet us in an inferno of contempt. I'll read two more tiny poems. I wrote this one thinking of my mother, my mother who left us so early, she was barely 60. An earnest blackness. There's an animal tucked in my hair and it hangs like a mirror I can't see. It's full of silence, shadows asking, are we caged or free? Sometimes it licks my skin but doesn't disturb me. When I reach to touch it, I can't remember where it is, if it is but it's more cunning than I thought, hiding its paw prints, 
patiently waiting to catch me with reflections of ebony nights, white stars, burnt orange dust. I know and I don't the hum of rain on a tin roof. The taste of my grandma's sweetened mangoes, moulded like a donkey's ear, plucked fresh from a tree. That's a silhouette above my mother's bones. Finally, I'd like to share with you one year. I wrote this mostly to reflect how sometimes we're so unclued to what's happening around us. We don't notice other people but ourselves. He stepped into his body and wondered who would find him when the world was too busy with trending. Hashtag Thanos. Hashtag Salah. Hashtag Thrones. He'd be porridge before anyone thought to miss him. He would turn into a blot and then a gruel, sickly green and oozy, a melt of bile. As a random stranger someplace else picked herself up and was astonished to find a new friend request tucked inside notifications, celebrated the new connection with a few hearts and hashtags to witting until dawn. Hashtag White House. Hashtag Bachelorette. Hashtag Me Too. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to stop my sharing now. Oh my gosh, that was <laughs> so, so fabulous. Let's see, are we on shared view? Mm, let's do, let's do gallery. So we, I, each other. thank you so much. That was, <laughs> that was so, oh my gosh. Well, I think I've told you before, I love your work and your images are so um, cutting, incisive and compelling. I, what made you choose prose poetry? How, how did you come to, to be doing, to be using this form? It's a very difficult form. It's, it's very much to my mind like tightrope walking, which you do with a plum and skill. Yeah, I've always been very interested in poeticity and rhythm. And because I love the short story, I'm fascinated with it. I needed to find something that would allow me to use both forms, almost like a flash fiction, but also with the poeticity and the rhythm and the rhyme and not have to worry too much about the rules. <laughs> just to put myself into the abstractness and the surreality of the writing and just let the prose poem tell its story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was trying to keep up with some of the many incredible lines that you had. I have an inferno of content. I was like, oh, wow, yeah. A coincidence of strangehood how do you begin to gather your images? Do you keep notes on images? Do you, is it automatic writing? How, how, tell, tell us a little bit about your process, if you don't mind. No, not at all. That's a really good question. I, I work on a trigger. My, my life is very busy. And so my every day is writing what I see, what I feel, what I hear. And um, I, I, I don't know whether to call it a gift, but sometimes certain phrases stand out to me. Somebody could say something, I could be listening to the news, just a, a particular string of words suddenly triggers something. And that begins the beginning of a cross poem. And uh, usually it's a curiosity. And when I start writing, I don't know where it will take me and it just shapes itself and I read it out loud and just listen to the flow. Mm. Yeah. Would you it's name the 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not much of a planner. Usually, mm. I, uh, it's very instinctive. I write from the gut. Would you name for our listeners the collections that you read from? I I know I was familiar with one, but the, some of the pieces came from another, right? That's saving right. shadows and yeah. Uh, yes, so um, the Saving Shadows, which came out in 2021, and uh, I just lost my, give me a moment, I'll just sure. bring my screen up again, I've lost you from my view, there you are, I can see you. So there's Saving Shadows, which, which came out in 2021, there's also Black Moon, which came out in 2020, and then um, there's also uh, Speculate, which I wrote with Dominic Heck, it's a collection of prose poetry where we respond to each other, it's very playful. So oh, I write a piece and then she responds to it. She looks at a word or a trigger, anything that she sees, and then she picks it up. And so these are three of my favorite prose poetry collections. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I love this word that you use that um, it's familiar to me, but I haven't thought about it lately, which is trigger, that you use triggers. Are these predefined triggers or? Are you just saying things you respond to? It's things that I respond to. So anything that um, pulls me, anything that I hear that draws an instinctive response in me, then that's a trigger. I, I don't think about it too much. It's just whatever <laughs> it shapes itself into. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Um, yeah, you talked about faces of your dead friends. The world was too busy with trending. I love your sly humor. So what's interesting to me is that even as you read it, you're still playing the straight woman. You don't give us a hint. And then we hear it and I'm just like, oh, come on. I know you're being satirical. I know you're being funny there. You're not gonna tip your hand. It's like, if I'm not listening and paying attention, I, you, I just won't get it. But if I am, then I'm gifted, you know, uh, then I'm endowed with the richness of your, of your references, of your sleight of hand. Um, is humor important to you also? It is, and, and mostly the playfulness with language. I, I love language. I, I love text. I, I get very passionate when I'm working with text. And um, I, I'm really infatuated with writers like Toni Morrison mm. or even um, critics like Roland Bach, who mm. really love the playfulness of language, which, what you can do with writing with text. And so because my, my writing is sometimes very somber, it could be a dodge, it could be a warning, it could be a longing or a memory where I've had so much tragedy in my life. Mm. Both my parents have passed away, my elder sister died of AIDS and she lost so many children in the process. And I'm the kind of person who feels things really deeply. And so when I see Black Lives Matter and things that happen, in, even in other countries, it doesn't have to happen directly to me. I am a mother of a black son and so all of this really work to inspire me and so it's important also for me to infuse the writing with levity so that it's not mm. too somber that the mm. listener mm. switches off but it's still the message is still there even in its lightness it's still playful but it's still somber mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel I, that gravity I feel that yeah that gravity and your gravitas i was and, and you you already spoke to it a little bit i just want to underscore it or pull out more because unfinished that piece unfinished i was struck by i was like but how can she know this She's in Australia. It can't be like that in Australia. She's in a she's in an Oz. And it sounded more more about America than Australia. So yeah. you just spoke to that a little bit. But if you wanted to say more about that. 
Yes, so there is a lot of disparity in Australia as well, not as bad as it is in the US. So there's still the um, unfairness that happens to black people and mm. not just to migrants, but also to the First Nations people. Mm. A lot of mm. wrong has been done mm. to them. Mm. And I see our cultures as very similar because they have a close relationship to family and to language. And one of the first things that the colonialists did was to take away their language. Mm. They were forbidden to speak their language. Their mm. children were taken away from them. Their babies were snatched and put into white houses to be um, made into white people mm. and so I, I feel things very deeply mm. and because I watch a lot of CNN I watch a lot of news <laughs> <laughs> I feel almost American. Me too. <laughs> and so oh, when I see everything that happens, I feel it so deeply as if it's mm. happening to me. I mm. can empathize with the situation and with the mothers as well, particularly as a mother of a black boy. Mm. Yeah. You're a handsome son, which I got to, <laughs> I got to, I got to glimpse you, her handsome son. So. <laughs> yeah, but I have a friend of mine who calls him devastation. <laughs> Yeah, I think he knows that he's a good looker. He's got the best of both worlds. Oh, yes, he, he's, he is a good looker. Let, let, let's, let's just hope he uses his power for good. I hope so. He's very interested in acting and he's done um, mm. minor roles. And so I hope he'll be able to be an influencer because he does. Mm. He gets very passionate about things, which I hope he gets it from me. Yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful well keep yeah. up keep up the good parenting and the good connecting um i know i i'm sorry i cut you off there was something else you were going to say uh, i was going to say that what i really love about poetry and prose poetry is that it, it's quite cross-genre you you don't have to restrict it to a particular genre it could be fantastical it could be horror it could be a blend of things and especially when i write black speculative fiction it cuts across different genres and different forms i love its fluidity how abstract it is there's so much you can do and it can also be very subversive and so i know I hide a lot of messages in my I, I didn't I was I was going to say that but for me they weren't hidden what I loved is that they were so integrated that that um it, it it's like uh, so often when one undertakes to talk about um social concerns and social slash political concerns, because depending on your point of view, everything's political or everything's, but so often it's, it's deemed agitprop or dismissed. And I love how you imbue everything with that point of view, um, with, how you slide it on in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the beginning, before we went live, I asked you about pastoral poetry. And I think in my way, my, my poetry is pastoral because I write about things around me and it's not just national, it's pastoral on a global stage. Mm. I, I see, I feel, I hear, and I connect with all of that. And uh, that's when I write on what I call a trigger because I, it, it's a response to, to what I perceive. I felt it most when you talked about the Indian farmers, who that that's an issue that I've um, cried about, not organized for, but participated in, you know, the the anti um, mega corporations telling farmers how to grow food and create aiding genetically modified organisms that destroy their crops or introducing them to ways of propagation that's anti-natural and, you know, anti, and then the farmers being poor and bereft and killing themselves. Yeah. And, and and when you had that, I was like, oh my gosh, someone else who thought about this. It was, I, I thank you 
I thank you for that because it, I know it's still going on. And, yeah. um, and, and sadly, not to the extent it is in India, but for even where I live, the small family farms are, are suffering, are disappearing, you know, for these corporate conglomerates. Meanwhile, there's a whole nother strata, maybe we need to write about, I need to write about, you know, there's a whole nother strata of society where you want grass fed beef, you don't, you don't want, you know, mutant meat anymore, you don't want frankenfish. I mean, there are people who, but somehow now it costs more to do what we used to do naturally. Uh, it, it, it's just so amazing. I, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop yeah. because I, I'll go on and on about that. Uh, and, and our time is almost done. So um, I'm, I'm trying to think, well, let me give you a moment. Is there something else you'd like to say before we wrap up? I, I think you and I are very similar because we have a strong positioning on social justice and social injustice. And I think irrespective of where we are, we feel things very deeply and we use our voice and our text to have these messages out and to be able to share them with the world. Yeah. So thank you so much for this opportunity today. I thank you so very, very much for joining me. I had admire your work ethic, your productivity, and your creations. They're, they're wonderfully um, life-affirming, even with their searing view of what it is we have about us. We, we've got to examine what's going on. And I, I delight in how you do that and that you do that, that, that you do that is very, very valuable to me. And so from the past to the future or from one now to another, of oh, folks who don't know what I'm saying, she's, she's, mm -hmm. she's to, I'm in, um, I told you where I am, I'm in America, but in Australia, it's tomorrow. And, or she can say, she's talking to yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Eugen, for sharing sharing your wonderful work and time with me for, for your efforts. And I wish you the best of luck, um, many more awards. I mean, you're nominated. I know you're going to get some more and um, stay well. And to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, please continue to have hope. This is a rough day in America keep the faith, uh, keep creating, stay well, everyone. Blessings and peace. Thank you.